just got a piece of our history over here. This is Hadrian's Wall, or at least what's left of it. It stretched way up there originally and miles in that direction and miles in this direction. But it feels so historical, doesn't it? Just sat here in the landscape. It seems to tell us so much about the might of the Roman invader and their fears of the people who were attacking from this direction. What we seldom think so much about, though, is the fact that every single one of these blocks had to be brought here by someone, hacked out of a piece of rock, transported, and then stuck one on top of the other, and then somebody had to do a bit of pointing. And that's what this series is about, those people and people like them. Forget about the Roman emperors and the kings and queens. This series is about the people who literally made our history. The medieval wool industry would have been nothing without fullers spending hours in stale urine. Without the Victorian navvies to build the tracks, trains would never have gone anywhere. Henry VIII's court would have come to a messy halt without gong scourers keeping the sewers flowing. And Handel's water music was only possible because violin string makers were prepared to get their hands dirty. Oh, in fact, a heck of a lot of jobs on the lowest rungs of the historical career ladder involve some kind of disgusting substance or other. Blood and gore and urine and dung. I'm going to be up to my waist in all of them because when I've established what I consider to be the worst job in any particular era, I'm going to have a go at it myself. Welcome to the worst jobs in history. Program, we're looking at the worst jobs in the thousand years up to 1066. Some were hard, some were messy, yeah. others were just frightening. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ! Written history began when the Romans invaded, and they brought some horrible jobs with them. Now, we know what the Romans gave to us, all those lovely straight roads and measurements like the mile and the calendar, but it wasn't all one way. They wanted something from us. Gold. Gold was very important to the Romans. They used it as a status symbol, and we had it here in southwest Wales. The Romans sought it out deep underground, but getting it out was one of the worst jobs in the Roman Empire. The Romans had plenty of rotten jobs, most of them done by slaves. But for me, the worst of them all was working in the gold mines. Even Pliny the Elder, who had slaves of his own, was shocked at the conditions. It was so bad that working in the mines was used as a means of punishment. The local population in Wales was plundered for healthy people to dig out the gold. Welcome to the worst job of Roman gold miner. The gold has come from the centre of the earth. It's been erupted through volcanoes, etc., millions of years ago, and due to uh, the movement of the earth and plate tectonics, it comes out in this higgledy-piggledy manner. You've just got to keep on digging it, and it might take you up, it might take you down. So do you have to chase these things? You'd have to chase it. Basically, at any point, it could open up to a bigger vein. So you'd have to keep on chasing it down and down until you know you've come to the end. How do you get the stuff out? You use a pick. Well, it'd be pretty difficult to swing a pick in here, wouldn't it? It's a small pick. I hadn't realised you meant a pick quite as small as this one. How do you use it? You just chip away. You, you can see you've got a quartz vein there. Yeah. So you've got to try and chip away at that... Uh, to expose the quartz and actually to get it out. Just chip away at the ordinary rock and... That's right. I hope the quartz comes away. Oh, it is peeling off a bit, isn't it? It is, yes. What do you think the conditions would have been like? Uh, pretty horrible. 
you can imagine in, in the summer would be very hot lots of men working here and um, they would have had candles they would have had small little lamps that they would have used um, but the rest of the mine would have been obviously totally uh, pitch black so in the summertime very warm in the winter very cold it would have been colder down here than outside so you can imagine you've got the, the worst of both worlds then really in some ways it's an easier job than i thought it would be because this rock fractures so easily but on the other hand it gets in your eyes, lucky you're wearing glasses, and up your nose all the time. And it's not actually the nicest job in the world. I should think half of them, oh, I've got a bit of quartz there. Half of them would have been blind by the time they'd been doing it for a year or so. In fact, many of them died before they had the chance to go blind because the Romans were impatient and were always coming up with more efficient ways of doing things. Getting through lots of rock quickly was a priority, so they came up with fire setting, a process of smashing rocks on an industrial scale. The cost in lives didn't matter. The workers' lives were cheap. And if you look at this area here, if you can imagine, what you would have done is built up this area full of timber, uh, branches, logs, etc., and set it alight. You would have kept that going then for maybe three or four days. God, it would have been smoky in here, wouldn't it? Exactly. You would have had a lot of smoke. It would have been an intense heat here as well. Also, parts of the rock would have started to break and shatter at that point. But after then a few days, you'd throw water on it, buckets of water, and that would cause a bit like a mini explosion. The whole face there would, would crack and shatter. So it'd be an incredibly boring job, a very smoky job, and then a very dangerous job. Exactly, but it, it would show you where the seam is going then. Once it's all shattered, you get a, a pile of rock, just like we got here. The problem then is that you're left with large quantities of rock to carry out. It takes this lot, 10 truckloads, to get one load of quartz out. Within this much quartz, there's maybe a piece of gold the size of half a cube of sugar. In Roman times, it all came out by hand. Hundreds of men would have been doing this. Bent double, oh, oh. carrying big heavy loads day in, day out. And if the weight wasn't bad enough, there was always the danger of falling rocks. Well, it's fine when the tunnels are wide, but when you get to about here, they're carrying this weight and having to duck down too. To make emperors like Nero rich took the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of early Welsh miners. People who were forced to work in the most horrible, dark and dangerous conditions. Life was hard for the first 400 years of British history, but at least when the Romans were gold mining, something beautiful came out at the end of it. For the Saxons who followed them, though, things were pretty bleak. Look at the materials I'm going to have to be handling to break into the Saxon building trade. The Romans brought a sense of order with them. They were very civilised. They built streets with houses and workshops in neat straight lines. Then they left. And what did we do? We went back to this. When the Romans left, we went back to living in mud huts in higgledy-piggledy streets. This was how most of the country lived until the middle of the Middle Ages. Despite all that, the people who lived here after the Romans left were part of a very highly structured society. At the top were the local kings, Below them were various kinds of noblemen, all of whom were warriors, so basically their job was to fight. And below them was everybody else doing the ordinary jobs. At the bottom of the pile, propping up everyone else, was the Saxon peasant, the churl. He didn't get paid, he had a few acres of land, and his job was simply to keep himself and his family alive. He needed to be a jack of all trades. Farmer, builder, he had to do his own baking, he was a woodsman, and he also had civic services to perform. Most people, of course, lived off the land, which meant that they had to work it, which brings us to a very difficult and back-breaking job. Would they have had to do very much ploughing? 
Ploughing was quite literally a matter of life and death. If you didn't work the land, if you didn't have plough your fields and plant your crops, you wouldn't have food on the table. So ploughing was important to everybody right through society. Why did they use oxen and not horses? Cattle are much stronger than horses. They're beefier. They can wade through the kind of soil that we're working on here. Horses were much rarer in the Anglo-Saxon period. They, there were horses, but they tended to be grander animals, so they were the kind of things that higher, uh, more important people in society would own. The word acre is an old Saxon word. It was the amount of land one could expect to plough in a day. It wouldn't have looked as sophisticated as this, though. Their ploughs weren't made of metal. That does make a difference. Or so I'd like to think. Let's have a look at the plough itself. It's fairly rudimentary. Yes, but it does the job. Now, what you've got to do is stand at the back and get a good grip either side on the handle here. OK. OK. How do I dig it in? You've just got to lean a little bit of weight on it as you go along. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. How do I make them go? When you want them to, to move forward, yeah. you're going to say, walk on. Yep. It's Edwin and Oswin. So if you call their names first of all, yep. they'll wake up and they'll go, aha. <laughs> Edwin, Tony's in charge now. Edwin and Oswin. Edwin and Oswin. Yes. Edwin, Oswin, yeah. walk on. Right. What we're going to do... You've said walk on and steady uh, boys already <laughs> and they're just static. Yes, Look but it's got to be a commanding tone oh. of voice. All right, OK. okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I do when I come to a corner? Um, you just got to try and bring the plough across yeah. a little bit. OK. That'll mark through the steering, yeah. OK? I'll be beside you in case you fall over in the mud. I can't believe it's that difficult. <laughs> we'll give it a try. Okay. Nice commanding tone of voice. Edwin, Oswin, walk on. Come on, walk on. Walk on. Come on. Walk on. Come on, you fat That's boys. It. All right, go in. Walk on. It's very boggy here. Hold it up straight. Yeah, it's difficult not to get it skidding off walk to one on. side, isn't it? What makes this really difficult is the weight, lack of it. This plough is very light, so to dig it in, you need to apply a lot of weight to it and lean heavily downwards. Ah, that's better. Of course, as a Saxon, I wouldn't have had a team of people helping me out. Whoa! It's all right. They're learning who's boss. Yay! Edwin, get round. Get your bum round this way. Come on! To be quite honest, I think they're a bit fat and spoiled, these two. <laughs> That's better. What the? This might look like a bit of fun, but for a Saxon farmer, it wouldn't have been. This was That's the day it. job. The job he had to do continually to ensure food for him and You've his family. You've forgotten your commanding tone of Oh, sorry, yeah, I was concentrating on <laughs> keeping the furrow straight. I know you'll find that quite hard to believe. Here we go, look at this. Good boys, good boys. As well as all the other stuff, this was just one more job. Okay. I was crap right. at it. Right. I just want you to see this finely tilled field. I think my crops are going to work pretty well this year. Good boys. But looking after the family's needs wasn't simply a matter of putting food on the table. The churl also had to provide shelter, and this came from wood. In the Saxon period, 70% of the country was covered by trees. And people really did use wood for lots of stuff, from firewood to ploughs. One of the things that we know they used wood for was making their houses, and to make them they used this rather spindly looking stuff which would eventually be transformed into a wall looking like this. This is wattle, isn't it, for wattle and daub? That's right. How do you set it up? We're going to weave this into the hurdle yeah. on al the alternate side to the rod below it. So yeah. if, you, if we put the, the butt of that in, in front of the, the end zale like that, yeah. take it in front of that zale. Looks like it'll snap off, there. doesn't it? Well, it should be flexible enough to, to come down. Push it down at that end, yeah. Tony, and then foot on it. Oh yeah, it really does kink, doesn't it? That's right. So it's, it's, it's green, so it's so it's flexible. Turn it down there. And then when we get to the end, yeah. we have to bring this round. Now if we just if we just pull it, yeah. it's gonna just it'll snap. Yeah, yeah. So we have to separate the fibres. 
and we do that by if you want to just put your put one hand there yeah you're going to pull it towards us yeah and we're going to twist as we do it so where, twist away twist yeah twist away that's it like that and eventually we should see oh yeah it's, it's turning into rope isn't it that's right it becomes, it's very it becomes very flexible yeah that's and that comes round and that one might even go that's behind that up right there to finish it off Oh, brilliant. Well, only another 60 and we'll have a wall. Building this little bit took ages, and all I was doing was assembling it. I didn't have to gather the right sorts of wood and strip it all down and split it and make sure I had enough of the right length. This might be interesting if you were doing some arts and crafts, but as a job, getting 20 or so of these together for a house or fencing wasn't my idea of fun. The worst part still waiting for me. This is what a finished wall should look like, but as you can see, it's pretty drafty. So the next job is to fill in the gaps. And to do that, we need daub, hence the term wattle and daub. And daub comes in four parts. There's water, straw, mud, and one other ingredient. Why dung? If you're using a lot of topsoil to cover a wall, the trouble is with topsoil is if you mix it with water and you slap it up on the wall, once it dries it can crumble and fall off. So if you put this stuff in, then it acts like a binding agent and really holds the soil together. Plus of course you need to put some straw in as well. It's going to take a long time to fill our bucket, how much are we going to need? Uh, buckets and buckets of the stuff, or as much as the horses will actually give us. Great. <laughs> Next thing is we need some water just to squidge it all up, as I say. Yep. So I pull that like so. And you need a lot more water than you'd think. So that's just the first bucket. Then another one. Okay. And then we might as well put the, the binding agent in. Great. Right now. Let's get rid of this. Yep. And, yep. More in that. and then spread it round a bit. Like so. Yeah. And then you need your straw. Well, this stuff's pretty important. So when the when the mud cracks a bit in hot weather, this holds all the pieces. What we need to do now is just get in it. Yeah. Like so. And stomp. And stomp. And you've got your wellies on, but I've got my Saxon boots, which are designed to leak. <laughs> well, they do. So far, so and good. Treading in this wasn't too to bad, you. just a bit smelly. I bet that's good for the skin. Oh, wonderful, yes. This is going to be a good brew, actually. Next, though, there's Not the messy bit. Bruiser. With a little bit of a knack to this, you get a handful like that, yeah. roll it into a sort of blob. Yeah. Then you always start at the bottom, we find that's best, because each layer sort of supports the layer above. Clonk it on, and then you get your palm, and you just smooth it in like this. So I get a big dollop. Like so. Like this, yeah. Roll it into a sort of little bit of a ball. Oh, it's getting mixed up with my scarf. <laughs> Start at the bottom and just yeah. slap it on and then slide it into the wood. Slap it on! That's it. Slide it in. Oh, you splashed me with your dollop. <laughs> oh, you'll get me back. There we go. Very therapeutic, oh. isn't it? Your psyche must be pretty messed up if you find this therapeutic. Right. Or less messed up. Yeah. Into that crack. And once you get your system going, it's amazing how fast you can cover a wall. I wish you wouldn't keep doing that. Oh, I keep smashing. Yeah. <laughs> At the end, it should have looked like this. Lovely, isn't it? After he whittled his wattle and slapped his door, the churl's chores had only just started. Life in the house was very dull and incredibly repetitive. For instance, the fire was the focal point of all the activity in the house, but it did not burn up a lot of fuel. It could take up to four hours to get enough wood just to keep this one single fire going, which was why it was important to have the children around, because that was a job that they could help with. And then there's this 
the daily grind. That's where we get the expression from. This is the quern stone where they used to grind the corn. How did this work, Fiona? Well, the barley grains go into the middle of the hole in the quern and you turn it and rotate it. And the two stones squash the grains together to make flour. So is there flour beneath these two now? There is. Oh, amazing. And how long would you have to do this for? It takes about three to four hours to produce enough flour to make bread for a family of 12. So after you've done the three or four hours grinding, you can relax a bit by kneading the dough. And when you've done that, you'd form it into little patties, put it on the fire, and when they were cooked, you'd have enough bread for the family. But your whole life wasn't just limited to what happened in the house. Sometimes civic duty called. The Dark Ages were turbulent times. By 850, England had formed into three warring kingdoms, Northumbria, Mercia and Wessex. They fought each other and outsiders. On top of his other jobs, the churl had to do national service. All those axes, swords and armour required iron. And that created another terrible job, the Bog Iron Hunter. What are we after, Jerry? What we're looking for, Tony, is, is, is a stuff called bog ore. It's the, the, the iron ore that was used certainly in the Saxon period. In Saxon times, bogs were the main source of iron ore for smelting. The wetlands were where the ore had developed across millions of years. It then just had to be found. Who would the guys have been who would have been doing this? Probably at the very bottom, I think. I mean, it's a mucky, hard, endless job because they would probably be needing, possibly when they were doing a lot of iron smelting, 30 or 40 kilos a day. It's all right for us because we've got wet weather gear on, but they wouldn't have had anything. Oh, it's, it's, it's a thankless task because obviously the iron smelter was dependent on getting his iron ore. It's a bit like a needle in a haystack, isn't it? It's to it is, it is. I mean, they probably know a good idea where it is, but not exactly where it is. And because they'll be utilising it year in, year out, they're always looking for new sources, so they'll be out there all the time looking for it and probing for it. I found something that's yeah. going clonk a bit. Just get that out. OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. You say the sort of thing. Is it it? It is. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look like anything special, but that is bog ore. How much metal do you reckon there is in there? Well, I think if we were going to do a, a smelt tomorrow, we'd probably need another 10 or 15 of these, because uh, it only weighs perhaps two or three kilograms, that's and they're very... just scattered off around the bogs. It's a frustrating job, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is. This was a back-breaking and thankless job. Out in all weathers in places like this. Four or five more lumps like the one we got, and I'd have enough for an axe. Being a bog iron hunter might well have been miserable, but they were lucky compared to those who had to use the finished article. In the Dark Ages, very few jobs paid money. Like the churl, most people just worked to live. But there were some specialised jobs. Someone had to work metal. Not everyone could do this. But to get metal hot enough to work with, required material capable of giving off great heat. Charcoal. Nowadays, all our charcoal is mass-produced. It's just something in a big sack that you heave into the back of the car. But in Saxon times, it was very different. Everybody needed charcoal virtually all of the time, and it all had to be made. And that was a long, hard, and very difficult job. Every little town and village would have had its own charcoal maker. They set themselves up in the forest, they cleared a space, and collected wood. Lots of it. Three tons or so. They then built it up into a sort of igloo shape, carefully placing the wood so it didn't collapse. This basically ended up as a sort of giant oven to slowly bake the wood. They lit a fire inside, which would have taken about five hours or so to catch. Right, well, it looks like it's the moment of truth. Be 
careful to make sure it just smouldered and didn't really burn as such. If it burned too strongly, then the whole lot would have gone up. Maybe also bits of the forest too. But what made this a really horrible job was the process once it was lit. What you had to do was just sit and watch it for up to 100 hours solid. You sit for many an hour watching a charcoal kiln, day and night. And the tendency is to get a little bit bored and to nod off. And it is very frightening to wake up and find a big hole in your kiln with flames leaping 12, 15 feet in the sky. So the charcoal burners developed a one-legged stool so that if they did nod off, they literally nodded off the stool. It kept them awake. Right. Let's leave them to it, then. We'll pop back in a few days or so. There's one other skilled craftsman who deserves a mention on any list of the worst jobs in history. A man who risked his limbs for his work. A man who lived constantly in fear, always afraid of being denounced for cheating. And my next worst job? Welcome to the world of the coin stamper. The Saxons produced the first penny in 765. At that time, every local area had to have its own mint. Each one had five or six people like this, cutting and hammering away and making coins. It was really like early piecework. But these guys didn't get paid, they got bed and board, yet they were surrounded by all this money all the time, and none of it was theirs. Coins had to be shaped. You might think that the poor old stamper would be tempted to snip off the odd bit of silver. If he was caught, the punishments were severe. Shaving a bit off the coins was seen as defacing the king's head, a very serious offence. The penalty? was castration. And if a whole coin went missing, then this guy's boss had his hand cut off and nailed to the door as a deterrent. So the pressure was really applied hard. Long, cold days in the mint and no chance of a mistake. Back out in the woods, Dave has been awake for 48 hours solid. But it's not over yet. For the charcoal burner, time is the enemy. There's still a danger that the whole lot goes up in smoke. And after another 24 hours, this is it, the big moment. After a week of hard work and sitting around staying awake, the Saxon charcoal makers were left with this much charcoal. And because charcoal was in so much demand in Saxon times, they just had to clear this lot away and start the whole process all over again. The monastery was a key part of Saxon life. Monks led a life of serenity, of reflection and prayer. A bit of singing and a lot of bowing. Compared with the drudgery of outdoor life, this looks pretty cushy. Hang on, that is just the telly. It may have looked like that in medieval times, or at least in our rather romantic vision of medieval times, with lots of cloisters and plain song and people praying and meditating very quietly. But in Saxon times, it was much harder. It was a really tough job. To start with, the monks would have lived in huts just like these, and they too would have had to build them themselves. They had to make their own bread, and they also had to do their own ploughing. In fact, the worst part of being a monk was that they had to do everything that everyone else had to do, and they had the day job. 
Well, this is a far cry from the medieval cloister, isn't it? Indeed it is, is yes. Is this it? This is exactly it, a Dark Age monk's cell. <laughs> what you see is what you get. They no furniture? Have, no furniture. A bit of blanket, perhaps, for a bed on top of straw. A few eating irons, you know, um, drinking vessel, plate, knife to, uh, to cut your bread. And that was it. And a uh, very, very strict prayer regime and all the other work they had to do as well. How many times did they have to pray? About eight times in 24-hour periods. And this isn't just hands together, eyes closed. This is oh, down no, the church? down to the church, yes. And they were, they were stipulated exactly at, uh, at the regular hours throughout the day. What times? Uh, starting just after midnight. Um, uh, bear in mind, of course, they didn't go to bed quite as late as we did. <laughs> just after midnight, then about 3.30 in the morning, then later at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock in the morning was called the first hour, first hour of daylight, when they'd be have their prayers and then they'd go off to work. And then straight after that, you'd have um, 9 o'clock time, then midday, and then um, about 5.30 in the afternoon. And then later, the, the late prayers before they went to bed. Went to bed about eight o'clock, you say. What happened if you just gave it a miss and slept in? Oh, that was just a definite no-no. Punishments were quite strict, quite severe. Anything, even being late uh, for a service would have, uh, would have, would have meant uh, severe punishments. What do you mean by punishments? There, there were various types of punishments. For the lesser faults, that there, you would almost certainly have to prostrate yourself in front of the brethren. This was called making the vania. Uh, what do you mean by prostrate yourself? Uh, well, I mean, would you like to demonstrate? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, there's some straw down there. Yeah, yeah. What you do is lie yourself down with your arms outstretched, like, like that, on your no, on, on your front, on your top. That's right, like that, arms outstretched, yeah. and that's where you would be. Yeah. And uh, the abbot and all the others would be around you, and you would stay there until such time as the abbot thought that uh, you could, you've had enough. Roughly how well, long? It could be, you know, as long as that particular gathering was uh, was in session. So you could be talking uh, up to hours, perhaps. I don't think my sin was particularly grave. No. And what other punishments were there? Um, for the gravest of offences, you could, of course, be thrown out of the monastery. No, or, or, you know, I mean, in, in, Doesn't sound too uh, bad a punishment to me. <laughs> well, it might have been a really good thing if you were that sort of person, and you just didn't really want to do it anyway, but if you were that sort of person, how would you fare in Saxon life? You know, you wouldn't really have to get, get on anyway, would you, really? This is St Cuthbert. Famous monks like him weren't in trouble that often, but their lives were still very hard, and some of it was accepted as a big part of the job. One of the worst parts of the job of being a monk has got to be atonement. This was the process whereby you suffered as a monk in order to try and prevent other people in your community from going to hell. There were lots of different forms of suffering, but one of the things that Cuthbert did was that he used to wade out into the sea, sometimes in the middle of winter and uh, in the freezing cold, and uh, oh, he'd pray for up to seven or eight hours at a time. He did it in secret, but people saw him and he became uh, very famous for it. I don't know if it actually stopped anybody going to hell or not, but what we do know is that within 300 years, the entire country was Christian. I tell you what, that was really cold. <laughs> the worst job of being a monk, though, was the writing. Great writers like the Venerable Bede give us a lot of our history of the period. But most monks didn't really write as much as just copy texts, which was far more boring. The danger of making mistakes was always there. Remember all those punishments? And they worked in cold conditions. Because they didn't have much light, they usually worked by open doors or windows. Remember, they didn't have glass, so they were always cold. One Benedictine monk wrote, writing tires the eyes, wearies the back, sends cramps through the arms and legs. But the worst part that was the danger. Because of the valuable books, monasteries were a prime target for raiders. And not just any old raider. The biggest danger facing many people in Saxon times was the Vikings. 
Vikings began raiding Britain in the 790s. Although they started out as raiders, once here, they began to settle down. Eventually, they created their own kingdom, the Danelaw, stretching from East Anglia to Yorkshire and beyond. The thing about the Vikings is that we have such a generalised view of them. They were these great hairy men who sailed across the sea in order to hack us to pieces, rape our women and set fire to our churches. But there was much more to them than that. Welcome to the worst job of the Viking warrior. Now, when I think of Viking boats, I think of pretty large ships with a dozen or so people rowing and the rest hanging around being carried to battle. It's fine when the wind's up and you can raise the sail, it fairly clips along. But I didn't think it would be like this. Just room for about 16 of us and we're all rowing. What would life have been like on the boat? Well, it would have been pretty cramped and uncomfortable. As you can see, we're, we're pretty tight in here, even as it is, and it's a lovely day. If we were going across the North Sea or the Atlantic on a rough day, we'd have water spraying all over us, and of course we wouldn't just be rowing in the, in the afternoon, we'd have the problem of we'd be here all night, so you've got to sleep in this space, we'd all be huddled down between the sea chests, no privacy, so it'd be cold, wet, probably extremely smelly. And remember, no toilet facilities. We've just got the side of the boat. Were there really women Viking sailors? There's at least one reference to a Viking army coming across from the continent to England, bringing the women with them. But for the longer voyages, when they went out to settle in the North Atlantic, settling in the Faroes and Iceland and so on, they took their whole families with them. The women would certainly have been on the boat, and the chances are they'd have done their share of the rowing as well. Oh! Oh! Slow and deep! Oh! Impossible to imagine how you could do it for two or three days in a squall with very little to eat, no toilet facilities. I mean, I know I'm the crappiest rower in the world, but if this isn't the worst job, I don't know what it is. <laughs> We've been rowing and bailing out for two days and two nights. Finally, land ahoy, and we want to get over here somewhere. So we've got two alternatives. We can either sail all the way round this headland, about 20 miles till we come to here, or we can carry the boat over this hill. This process was called portage. It was a common Viking practice. The two key aspects to it were speed, how quickly can this be done, and caring for the boat. Viking ships were made from single planks split radially from very long trees. Building them was tricky and time consuming, so repairs away from home were not a good idea. But more importantly, the ship was also a spiritual symbol. Important Vikings were buried in their boats. Ensuring that the boats were well looked after was very important. Gareth? Even with this number of people, I find it hard to believe that you could shift a boat as heavy as this one is by hand across a hill. How do you do it? Well, it's not going to be easy, but what we're going to do is shift it along these wooden runners. These things here? Yeah, so we slide it along the runners. Yeah. Um, it's going to be half lifted, half pushed, and we've got the rope there to drag it as well. And we slide it along the runners. Someone comes behind, picking up the runners once it's been over them, moving them round to the front, we just keep moving and keep moving. I don't understand, why wouldn't the boat just snag on these things? Well, this is where it gets really unpleasant, because to stop it snagging, the runners have got to be greased. With? Well, there's various things that we can use for that. Um, lard is one, butter is another, probably rancid after a couple of weeks uh, on board ship. But what we're going to be using is fish. These things? Yes, that's right. It's pretty absurd, isn't it? A line of fish with a boat sliding down them. We're not going to use whole fish. There's lots of oil and grease in there, but what we're going to have to do before we can use them is mash them up. Oh. It gets stinkier and stinkier as you go, isn't it? Oh, I'm glad I've got a cold. 
Right, what do we do with these little sweethearts now? Um, basically pick them up and smear them on the logs. The thing about these fish is that after four days in a box, they were really smelly. You can't imagine how much they stank. That was the worst part. At this stage, moving the boat looked like the easy bit. We've got it lifted already. Basically, what we're going to need to do is sort of half lift and half push. So get your weight underneath as far as you can. So you're taking some of the weight off the keel. That way, there's less weight to actually push forward. What's Viking for one, two, three, go? One, two, three, go. All right, one, two, <laughs> three, go. Right. Oh. Push. Oh. Towards me. Towards okay. me, Derek. Yep. Towards me. Keep it towards me. Push! Put your back down to it! Push! Come on! Push! 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 Keep it going! Push! Oh, we need some more rubber. Push! 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 The whole shoulder fish was like going right. Push! Come on! Push! I tell you, that fish grease really does work, but I have to say, that does have to be one of the worst jobs. But it wasn't the very worst. For me, the worst job of all in the Dark Ages was to Oh, I don't want to do this stuff, I really don't want to do this. I said I'd have a go at the worst job of each year and myself. So, what's the worst job that the first thousand years of British history can throw at me? Building a Saxon house wasn't the most pleasant of tasks. Oh. Being a Viking warrior oh. wasn't all plain sailing. Oh. And the life of a monk wasn't a bed of rosaries. Oh. But there was one job which I reckon was worse than any of those. It was a job where you risked your life for the most basic of foods where your workplace required a really good head for heights and where your technical equipment and health and safety were a bucket and a rope. But I've committed myself to doing it, even in this pouring rain. So welcome to the world of the guillemot egg collector. In the Dark Ages, guillemot eggs were much sought after. They were good to eat and bigger than most. Farming was tough and unpredictable. Collecting eggs was seen as essential. Many people believed that chickens were sacred, so you couldn't actually eat their eggs. That meant you had to look elsewhere. Like here. Getting to the eggs was difficult. People went over the edge on a rope with a bucket to collect them. They went out in all weathers and were often attacked by birds trying to protect their eggs. In Victorian times, the people who did this were known as climbers, it was a nasty job, but I geared up in Saxon clothes and had a go. Does this look reasonably authentic to you? Well, it's not too bad. How do we know that people were actually doing this? Well, there's an account from uh, the 10th century of a trader who visited King Alfred, and he described some of the uh, people that were harvesting uh, various products down birds and also eggs from what he described as egg mountain. Egg mountains? Well, that would take to be the sort of sea cliffs and the sea colonies. Why would they have been collecting guillemot's eggs in the first place? Well, guillemot's eggs would have been a big, rich form of protein at a time when other forms of food would have been relatively scarce. And the sea cliffs would have been laden with thousands of them. But they would have needed to keep the eggs. And without refrigeration, that would have meant that they had to have fresh eggs at least every two or three days. Would they have been doing this for money? No, this would have been the food that they needed. The biggest battle they faced was to put food on the table. And at some times of the year, in a bleak landscape like this, food could be very scarce. So the guillemots were actually nesting in the sheer cliffs? Yes, they tend to nest on, on ledges, and uh, they get pretty aggressive when you try and take their eggs. So right, you, right. you need to watch out for that. How did the egg collectors get down there? Well, they would have needed to use a handmade rope. Now, there are lots of materials they could have used, but what was very popular was to use seal skin like this. And this would have been cut and, bra and braided together to actually make a rope. They could have also, of course, used something like this. And just hang on to it and, uh, 
and go down. Well, pretty well. Uh, they would have needed to take a bucket with them to collect the eggs in. So you're one-handed? Well, yes. <laughs> if you think I'm doing it like this, you've got to be mad. Fortunately, uh, I'm going to be able to do it the proper 21st century way. Getting kitted up with modern safety gear didn't really make me feel any better about doing this. I'd chosen this as the worst job in the Saxon period for me. But even on a cliff with very few birds of any description, I was still desperately unhappy when it came to actually doing it. What we need you to do is come down here. Yeah. To these ledges. Yeah. We're already on the safety system. Yeah. Okay. This is oh, Rick. Jesus Christ. This is Rick. He's going to be a safety man. Yeah. All right. I've never had sailed in my life before. Oh, it's just it's looking down, mate. Just... Don't, don't look down. Just sort of concentrate on the road. Oh, shit! Yes, okay, keep looking at me. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. At this stage, I was really glad I wasn't being attacked like the Saxon egg collectors would have been, yeah. and that someone was passing the bucket down to me. Someone else had planted oh, eggs for me to find. Even so, I yeah. wasn't that confident. Yeah. Oh, I looked down, I looked down, I looked down, I looked down, it's horrible. Oh, can you see an egg? I can see an egg, I can see an egg, I can see an egg. I don't know how the hell I get at it, but I can see. Oh, my shoes come off. Oh, Christ. Oh. There's an egg over here. There's an egg just over here. It's horrible leaning back. And I don't know how I'm going to be able to get it in the bucket without breaking the bloody thing that's in my wrong hand. God knows how they lay the damn things here. It's only when you're this frightened. All your muscles go shaky, and it's hard to handle this thing. I'd quite like to uh, be uh, to come up now, really. Can I come up? So I had modern safety gear on, a warm hat, a whole team of people helping me, planted eggs, and I wasn't being attacked. But this was still, for me, the worst job of the Dark oh. Ages. Here's your eggs. I've got two of them. The worst thing was when my shoes fell off. And I looked down and they were just spiralling down towards the sea, hundreds of feet below. And then when I came away from the, the rock and kept coming forward again, my feet were just chafing against, against the rock. And I didn't... I'm a very good egg collector.